Ready to feel old yet? Well, time is a relentless march forward and my god is it accelerating. Way back in the ancient era of 2004, my first introduction into what a horror comedy actually was would be found by me, which arguably had a huge impact on why I cover the movies that are supposed to be horror with a comedic style. This movie had everything from biologically altered zombies to brain still somewhat functional to a strange explanation to humor where you wouldn't expect it. Really the video I'm making right now is just more of a love letter to the film than anything. Am I sentimental over this movie? Hell yeah, brother. But sentimental nonsense aside, we'll also be covering the biology anyhow. In England, a man named Sean's life is falling apart due to an extreme case of just wanting to go to the pub every night. An outbreak of a disease would eventually transform almost the entirety of the town overnight. Realizing in the morning what everyone had become, he would go on to try to round up his ex-girlfriend, his mom, Philip, who's not his dad, and any friends he could, in a bit to survive what amounts to basically a lock-in at the pub. However, like most ideas that involve a bar, things tend to kind of go differently in practice. So in today's episode, we'll talk about the actual origins of the disease, what it does neurologically to a person, how time may actually allow for a small bit of recovery within the infected's brain, and ultimately, why this is the most hilarious movie in existence to me. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. Are you ready to start eating healthy and getting your life in order? Well, much like how abs are made in the kitchen and not in the gym, so too is a healthier lifestyle. By heading to go.factor75.com forward slash Roanoke130 and using code Roanoke130, you can get $130 off across six boxes. What is Factor? Factor is a meal service that sends food directly to your home in recyclable boxes and materials. It makes eating healthier and achieving your goals so much easier as everything is portioned and measured right there in the microwave container for ready-to-eat meals. Doing keto to burn fat? They have options for that. Maybe you just want to cut calories. They have low-calorie options. Are you a vegetarian? Hey, they have that too. Basically, they have a choice for every meal type that you would want and every meal prepper. So look, I get it because I do it myself. You know you should cook dinner, but it's just so much easier to order out. Well, with Factor, you don't have to do that. Putting this meal in a microwave for two minutes ensures that you have an easily accessible, delicious plate waiting for you. So if you want to achieve your health goals and this sounds good to you, by heading to go.factor75.com forward slash Roanoke130 and using code Roanoke130, you can get $130 off across six boxes. All right, let's get back to it. So we kick off our story with this being Universal Pictures, which means your boy is once again totally screwed. But apart from the shrekening about to happen in this video, we meet our main character, Sean, at the pub with his girlfriend, Liz, as they're discussing why they're always back at the same pub. They go out with the same friends every night, Ed, who's Sean's longtime friend, and then David and Diane, who are Liz's flatmates. David looks like adult Harry Potter, more than Harry Potter actually looks like Harry Potter. And this is an important but good lord. 2004 style is really shining through. Basically, the whole scene is just dunking on our boy, Sean here who again Liz is concerned because they don't do really anything apart from just go to work go home go to the pub go home go to work sounds like a literal hell honestly because I mean where are you fitting in the playing of several hours of World of Warcraft in there anyhow the conclusion to all this is Sean just kind of agrees to get out of there and do more interesting things with Liz and spend more quality time together things will change he promises with that painful intro completed we now see everyone is just sort of zombified already in their functional life truly we do live in a society but as Sean gets up the next morning to continue his normal day to day, we meet his flatmate Pete. He does not like Ed, as he keeps leaving the front door open every night, which I don't know if that's a thing in England, but in the US, that's <laughs> not really a thing. Anyways, they all used to be friends like way back with Ed failing to launch, and he's really more of just a drag on everyone in the flat. Sean attempts to get Ed to start doing more around the house as Sean then leaves for work. They get a phone call from Liz that says book the table for eight instead of seven, but really none of this is gonna matter. As Sean goes to get his breakfast of champions, I love this part because it's like normal day to day stuff that will be slightly changed tomorrow with Git hitting a soccer ball, the homeless man asking for money with his dog, guy cleaning up his car, and other guy out for a morning jog. But as Sean heads into the shop to get his drink, he sees on the paper about crops in the area having used GMOs and how horrifying that is, which I break away for a moment to tell you, humans have been using GMO crops for like half a century at this point. I saw a video over how dangerous they were and blah blah blah, but even if you make a tomato fatter by combining it with an extraordinarily fat tomato, that's still considered GMO because it's been genetically modified. Basically, don't fall for that crap with like the scary words and ooh it's scary. But alright, getting off my soapbox. As Sean heads into work, honestly, everyone looks like, again, they're already zombies. As he goes along, people are dropping out at bus stops as something seems to be amiss. And I'm about to feel incredibly old right now, as Sean is then running a team as their boss is out because he feels bad. A 17 year old calls him old man because Sean's only 29. God, I remember believing, like when I first saw this movie, that 29 was old. And now I'm past that. Oh god. Anyways, to wrap this up, Philip comes in and tells Sean to bring flowers next time he visits his mom, and then Liz calls, which Sean tells her that everything is good to go at the restaurant, so no sweat. But sweat will be had because that was just a bold-faced lie. But as Sean goes to sell TVs,
plays on the TV, a news report comes over with military vehicles and hazmat suits, and people in general looking to take extreme care with something, as it seems to be a bit of an issue with military trucks driving by once Philip leaves. As Sean stops at the flower shop to get flowers for a wonderful mom, he spots a man outside in the park going Ozzy Osbourne on a pigeon, but then disappears. I mean, literally disappears like Batman style with a bus going by. Riding the bus home, everyone is either coughing or passing out. Kind of sounds like Georgia right now as a cold is sweeping through here and basically putting everyone on their butt, myself included, a few weeks ago. Getting off the bus, a man has passed out in his car as an ambulance arrives and then he runs into Yvonne, who's also just kind of surviving. She jogs his memory about having to call the restaurant and then he panic calls them and they just gave away their last table. He then gets a call from Liz as he suggests, hey, why don't we just go to the Winchester, which uh, that was not the right answer. Heading over to her flat, Harry Potter won't let her in as Sean attempts to scale the wall. Harry then scolds Sean as we get the feeling that maybe Potter has feelings for Liz, which is why he doesn't like Sean. So at this point, Liz then breaks up with Sean as it ceremoniously starts to rain. Oh man, I've been in there, walking in the rain, watching people make out outside of the bar, then heading in and proceeding to get annihilated. It is a classic. So Ed attempts to cheer Sean up to really no avail as they then proceed to get absolutely schlackered. As they talk about the interesting characters at the bar, a man shows up and smacks the glass, but then eventually goes away. Later on, leaving the bar, Sean and Ed walk past the couple who have been outside the whole time and they're still out there. Man, you think she would have like eaten through his neck by now, which uh, she actually has. In the background, that dude's head just starts falling off, which that sucks. And as the two walk along, you can't really hum what they're singing as I will literally get copyright hit on this video for like a melody being similar to his song. Like the game I'm covering in live streams, The Quarry, I use something that had the melody of a song and they're like, oh, that's copyright. It's ridiculous. Anyways, but because they're so hammered when the zombie responds with a groan, they don't really think anything of it. Getting home, they continue the party at 4 a.m. However, Pete isn't too jazzed about this. Coming downstairs, he yells at them, remarking that he's got a splitting headache and their stupid hip-hop isn't helping. Which actually, it's not hip-hop at all, it's electro. But Ed asks him how he was bit on the hand and Pete says that he was jumped after work and he has no idea why they bit him, but the front door is open again and he's pretty upset. He tells Ed to go live in a shed because he's so thick and that'll be important later, depending on your definition of important. And Sean writes to get his life sorted out and then passes out in the kitchen. Waking up the next morning, the same stuff is happening in different ways. Car broken, guy sprinting instead of jogging, but also it's the same because of society. <laughs> okay, I gotta stop joking about that. Anyhow, as they head into the shop, there's blood on the glass, but Sean really doesn't notice anything. The owner starts walking towards Sean, but he continues to not notice. Walking around with his breakfast of champions once again, he passes the homeless man and then heads back inside his house. We get the station broadcast that literally tells what's happening, which always made me laugh. Basically, as he flips through, it's a continuation of the same sentence, which is everybody's just literally being eaten alive. But then he decides to stop on one channel in particular as Ed tells Sean that there's a girl in the garden. Looking out there, there is indeed a girl in the garden, or really, yard in the US. Ed then throws a rock at her as she turns around and they think she's just completely hammered. She falls on Sean as Ed takes a picture, as then Sean pushes her off and she falls on a pipe. But then she gets back up like nothing happened. <laughs> that kind of sucks. So they both turn to go back inside as another shambler comes towards them. Sean tries to call the cops asking if they're actually still out there, and as Ed checks the window, yep, they're still right outside the window. Turning back to the TV, they are told to barricade all doors and windows as the front door was left open again. And if you ever watch my stream, if someone has an arm off, this is literally where I got that from because prom date over here has an arm off. They overpower him as they attempt to defend themselves from the zombies in the backyard next. After expending everything that they had, including the records, they just decide to break into the shed and get the cricket bat and shovel, which is pretty iconic. They then head back inside as the report says that they need to isolate anyone who's been bitten. Sean now realizes that Liz is still a person in the world and zombies are everywhere. Sean gets a call from his mom saying that some men tried to bite them, but only Philip was bitten, much to Sean's relief. So they devise a plan. Take car, go to mom's house, kill Phil, sorry, go to the Winchester, have a pint, and wait for all this to blow over. It's honestly the perfect plan, complicated by Harry Potter and his girlfriend and the zombie hordes. Looking out at the mail slot, they spot the horde shambling next to the car. Heading upstairs to clean himself up first, Sean spots Pete in the shower. Having turned in there, he shambles out and attempts to grab Sean, but he's able to escape as they head outside. They're then kicked by the kid with a soccer ball from earlier. Well, they're hit with the soccer ball anyways. And then they drive out into the hellscape of England. Ed puts on some punk rock as they hit someone and then they check on him to their relief. He was already infected. Pulling up to Sean's parents, Ed elects to stay in the car as Sean then heads inside to confront Philip. Heading into the living room, he goes to take out Philip saying he's sorry, but Philip hasn't actually turned yet. Philip seems to think it's just a bunch of drug nuts as Sean tries to convince his mom to leave with him. So at this point, Philip and Barbara both come out and find that Ed has crashed the parked car. The zombies arrive and bite Philip in the neck and then they all get in as Ed drives. Arriving at Liz's, Sean then exits through the moon roof and then heads into the apartment, or flat. Pushing the button, zombies show up, ruining Sean's chance to talk to them as he has 
to climb up to Liz's. Harry Potter then scolds Sean over causing more of the zombies to show up, and Sean convinces them to go as they exit the flat and then head back to the car. Ed pulls up as they all jump in and then head towards the Winchester. Philip at this point ain't looking so hot. Ed keeps smashing into everyone as Philip tries to get Sean's attention. Philip tells him that being a father isn't easy and then tells him to do well and look after his mom and then goes towards the light. Sean tells Ed to pull over as he finally does and then Sean says that Philip is gone to which his mom looks back there and uh no actually Philip's all right. The music then gets turned on in a scuffle and they have to leave Philip behind. The mom protests as Sean says there's nothing about the man in there that is her husband as then he leans over and turns off the music to his obvious relief which again this all this whole movie just makes me laugh but it's interesting as it indicates a piece of everyone is still in there despite meeting their end. Walking through the yards and hearing the chaos or just with bar patrons in the distance being eaten they run to Yvonne and her group which is almost an exact Walmart replica of Sean's group. She wishes them luck on getting to the Winchester as they part ways. Barbara at this point spots one of her friends in the house in another yard as Sean jumps over the fence and gets in a fight with a zombie. Ed and Harry then sit idly by as Sean's able to pin the zombie to a tree. Sean climbs up a slide and looks over the fence to spot the Winchester is completely surrounded. Looking at the zombie, they elect to now study it. Looking at its vacant face with a hint of sadness, they attempt to replicate its movement before heading on in an attempt to survive. Now, it could just be me, but it seems like a bit of a bad idea to like pit yourself in the middle of all this, but hey, whatever doesn't work. Moving through, it does seem to be somewhat effective for a time, but as they try to break in, they start to get noticed by other zombies. A fight breaks out between Ed and Sean as Ed gets a phone call and then answers it. In the fight, they have alerted the entire horde that they are just standing there, and Harry has the wonderful idea of breaking the window, which forces Sean to try to lead the crowd away from the rest of the group as they all head inside with Barbara finding flowers in the trash can. Going inside, Harry wants to fix or repair the window before Sean gets back. Liz tells him that they need to remain quiet as he's basically alerting everyone out there that they are in here. Like a total tool, Harry is bringing up some valid points, unfortunately. What is it? The worst person you know just made a valid point about basically food and water and what are they going to do? Liz yells at him to stop until Sean returns. Sean has now officially returned and Harry asks him, how did you get away? And Sean says, I just gave him the slip. He got in through the back door, which he tried to tell them before he broke the window, exposing them. So they spend the rest of the night sitting there asking one another if anyone would like a peanut and drinking beer to pass the time. The streetlights end up coming on, which lets everyone know that they actually do still have power. As Sean goes on to turn the power, he spots the window is absolutely filled with infected as there are in fact zombies inside of the building too, as the doorknob turns. Ed then borrows money from Liz as they flip through TV stations. Ed then goes on to a lottery machine or a slot machine or whatever it is, turning it on, letting everyone know outside that they are inside. The bar owner now shows up to begin the attack as Queen plays. You can't hear it because I will absolutely get decimated with copyright, but trust me, they're going to the beat. They attempt to quietly take out the owner, which doesn't go very well as they can't do enough damage. Harry then heads back as he flips the switch, lighting up the whole area, and then throws Sean a force multiplier as they realize this thing is actually loaded. And again, this is kind of funny to me because like in the US, it's just so common, but they uh, now have a successful way of repelling the zombies, but Barbara isn't looking so good. She gives Liz a necklace as Liz then realizes that Barbara was actually bitten early on. Why is there always someone who was bitten that doesn't tell the group? Who knows? So Sean can't aim at all, which again is hilarious, but they're able to repel enough of them as Liz calls over Sean and tells him that she's infected. They give Harry the Elder Winchester as Barbara then begins turning and convulsing in front of Sean. Harry pulls the Winchester on Barbara as Sean breaks a bottle and pulls it on Harry. Harry is speaking facts, but everything he says is tainted because he likes Liz. So this results in a standoff where Barbara is allowed to get back up as she's gone full zombie. Sean takes her out at this point, which Harry doesn't make the situation better. Sean then turns and punches Harry, who grabs the Winchester and pulls the trigger on Sean, but it's empty. Harry then freaks out and tries to leave, but stands in front of a window. Before he can apologize to Sean, the window is then broken and Harry is pulled out, and he's basically just eviscerated, which is, I mean, it's kind of brutal. So as his limbs fall off at this point, the whole place is just absolutely inundated because Diane tries to go get Harry. Pete then arrives to the party and bites Ed on the arm as Sean takes out Pete, who responds to his name being called, which means there is some memory. The three of them then end up behind the bar with Ed bleeding and infected as Sean ignites it, but leaves the shells on the counter, which start popping all of them off. Heading down into the cellar, well, things aren't looking too good. They can't get out, and now the whole bar is on fire. Sean asks who idea it was to go to the Winchester anyways, and they decide that their plan has to be to take themselves out of the game, as there's only a few rounds left. Sean then decides that he can't really take out his mom, his girlfriend, and his flatmate all in one day. As they go to light up a cigarette, they spot the lift controls to get out. Sean gives Ed the Winchester, as Ed's last parting gift is a terrible one. With the infected breaking through, Liz and Sean take the lift up to the street. Arriving at the surface, there's less of them, but still quite a few. Before they can begin their attack, though, the military finally 
finally arrives to take out the infected. Yvonne had come back for them with the military as the infection has been brought under control. We see through the news broadcasts and TV shows that the infected retain some of their mental abilities and prior behaviors. Liz and Sean are back together as their life now is apparently much more simplified as they've had enough adventure for now. Sean says that he's going out to the garden for a bit and then heads to the shed. Sitting down, he begins playing PS2 with Ed, who is now still infected. But he still seems to be somewhat able to play, although I guess it would be like a gorilla playing PS2. Probably not too much help in terms of help, but he's still got his friend who is now officially living in the shed, which was actually Pete's suggestion. Kicking this thing off, for us to understand potentially where this virus came from, as a few possible explanations are given in the movie, with most of them immediately being cast aside, we must first take a look at the physical effects of this virus and what it does to the body to determine if this would be a naturally occurring virus or something that was completely altered by human hands. First and foremost, I would be inclined to believe that this is a virus over any other form of life, although depending on the scientists that you're talking to, viruses may or may not be life themselves, but you're listening to this massive nerd of a scientist right here, and you know, it checks off most of the boxes, so why not? Let's just call it life. The reason I believe it to actually be a virus is how it'll move through a population quite rapidly and shortly after exposure, people began dropping out, but also that the first generation of the infection seemed to be much slower, with much more varied effects until a few generations down. This virus became more efficient after taking over a host's body the more times it infected. Bacteria and parasites would be ruled out by how quickly it can actually spread and the way it spreads. While bacteria from a human bite can actually make you sick, what would be required to turn you into a cannibalistic monster is well outside of the ability of bacteria, as usually the toxins that bacteria produces as a byproduct of its existence is what makes you sick. This interaction with your body would likely just induce physical symptoms and anything relating to the brain would likely be inflammation, coma, and ultimately the person's untimely demise. There would be nothing to make them get back up after their infection, which means we can probably safely rule bacteria out as being the culprit. As for parasites, the main issue here is the way in which it spreads. Again, humans biting humans is a major thing to get people sick. With that said, due to the speed, likely at first the virus had a chance of being airborne, if not for a short while before infecting a few unsuspecting people who immediately had immunological responses to the presence of the virus. Well, not immediately, but soon enough. If this was a parasite, then those that were infected with this small parasite would be incredibly unlucky, but due to the parasite's strength, the disease would meet its end with them. Parasites, while having the ability to interact with our brain, which my favorite example, as you all know, is toxoplasmosis, would not properly fit into this thinking as far as how quickly this spread. But moving back to toxoplasmosis for a moment, in rodents, toxoplasmosis enters the brain of the rodent. It can inspire almost a sexual attraction to the smell of cat urine, which will influence the rodent's behavior to the point that it will seek out cats in hopes of mating, which the cat in turn will then eat the rodent, which is what the parasite actually wants as it continues its life cycle in the cat intestines. Toxoplasmosis gondii also will make the rodent wander out in the open rather than sticking to the corners of tree stumps and logs or sides of buildings or really anywhere that would give it cover like it normally would do. This shows a fundamental alteration of the brain of the rodent. And what's interesting is when it infects humans, it still has a lot of the same effects, which, uh, you know, normal PSA time if you watch this channel. Uh, if you're pregnant and have an indoor outdoor cat, get your partner to change out the litter box as toxoplasmosis can severely harm a gestating child. But anyhow, when humans become infected with toxoplasmosis, this will ultimately influence human behavior, such as making us attracted to the smell of cat urine as well, which in a lot of times causes people to end up hoarding cats. And if you think this is crazy, well, think again, nerd. One in 10 people in the US have been infected at some point with the parasite, and in some cases in the world, 60% of a nation's population can be infected. So the moral of the story is this, typically you will clear the parasite, but even with these numbers that I have presented to you, as well as its effects that it has on the brain, I still do not believe that this is parasitic in nature. For a parasite to spread in mass like this, it would need to be something like to being coughed up on a person and a way to sort of traverse the air to make it initially virulent enough to actually be able to get enough people converted. But the other issue is the slow growing time. Parasites can be either amoebic in nature or multicellular. But seeing as either way it's a eukaryotic organism, this means it takes time for them to grow within the actual host as eukaryotic cells are fairly complex and it takes a lot for them to replicate effectively. Because of this, they just would not be fast enough to inspire these changes in a person upon their exposure to the illness. On top of this, after they have been converted, the body would have to absolutely be saturated with this parasite to exist within the salivary glands in enough capacity to be transmitted. A virus to me would make the most sense. Viruses are small enough to actually float through the air properly to be airborne and may have enough flight time to actually reach compatible hosts. To couple with this, a virus upon infecting its host is incredibly varied. 
varied. Some viruses actually have an incubation period as short as 24 hours, while others have an incubation period of literal years. But once this is over and the viral load has reached a certain point, this will inspire symptoms. In Shaun of the Dead, the virus starts simply enough. Our body will realize it's under attack by an invader quite quickly, as something is produced within the body that is critical for letting the rest of the meat suit know, hey, you know, I'm straight up not having a good time. When the virus enters cells and begins hijacking cellular processes and forces a cell to create more viral copies of itself, the cell isn't completely unaware that something has just entered that wasn't supposed to. When that happens, the cell will begin producing something known as interferon from its hundreds of interferon stimulated genes, which does as the name implies, it interferes with virus production, but is also a telltale sign given to the rest of the body that something is amiss. In this case, interferon will also tell the natural killer T cells in the body that they are infected, which the NK T cell will then order the cell to undergo apoptosis and destroy itself. The system is incredible if you think about it, but as always, viruses take something good and they just have to control it. A virus in a lot of cases has the ability to control this interferon response and has its own genes that will suppress the interferon response in the body. In fact, the global disease currently, at the beginning, there were quite a few variants, with some more alarming than others because typically they were more aggressive in stopping the interferon response. Right now, the virus on this planet can stop interferon response by up to 90%, stopping the body from realizing the infection is actually worse than it is. And this seems bad until you put it in comparison with other variants that literally died off because they were too aggressive and destroyed the host. And this resulted in a 99% interferon response basically being stopped, resulting in their bodies in a lot of cases not even realizing that they were infected in the first place until it was so bad that the body would go into stage 5 freakout mode because out of nowhere all these viruses just appeared. Life is a delicate balance with invasive organisms. If a disease is too aggressive, the person will expire and that line of disease will never progress as it took out the host too quickly. Sure, the virus is undetected, but it will never spread. A virus that announces its presence too early will be wiped out quickly, never spreading either. The virus has to put itself in a position of skirting a line between being eradicated by the body, but keeping the host alive and in a position to still move so that it can spread. All the while, the body has to mediate a response to the virus as not to injure and take out itself, itself being the host. Biology is basically a dance, and if your partner sucks at dancing, well, it ruins everything. So I didn't expect to go on that long of a tangent, but dude, just give me start talking about viruses and I can literally go all day. I'm actually debating on getting my master's in immunology and specializing in virology down the line, because clearly I have an interest in it. But anyhow, that's neither here nor there. The point is, with specific diseases in Shaun of the Dead, we see the body does in fact have a response quickly to something indicating that the virus moves into the body, the interferon production is ramped up to alert the immune system that they are under attack. Whereas something like a parasite would likely not inspire this reaction so quickly, unless you take the brain-eating amoeba, which appears to be making a massive comeback in our water sources due to how warm they're getting. But crippling fear aside, once the virus has infected, it's already too late. Once entering the body, the immune system will do what it always does when dealing with any virus. Our macrophages are the first to enter battle with NKT cells, finding and destroying infected cells. Now, the issue is, once the process has begun, your body cannot respond quickly enough. Within you are two versions of the immune system, the innate and the adaptive, with the innate system basically being your first line of defense when dealing with incoming pathogens, and then your adaptive immune system coming in two to three days later with things like antibodies and more T-cell interaction, and basically that's more specialized. But the innate, its purpose is to literally buy your body time if the infection is bad enough to bring out the specialized cells. Or if the infection is incredibly local, and it's not that big of a deal, it'll clean it up by itself. Once engaging in battle with a new virus, macrophages would absolutely be destroying at least some of the virus. The issue is, however, that macrophages are cells. Eventually they will tire because they will run out of energy, and they could be overwhelmed because there's only so many of them. They will put out signals to other cells in the area to begin entering an inflammatory stage to get fluid to flood the area that makes it easier to fight the pathogen. But the issue is, the virus is likely already bloodborne as well. Some cells will survive, likely from the bite area first, and then capture pieces of the virus. These pieces of virus are crucial because this allows them to be brought back to B cells for examination. This piece of the virus, or antigen, is shown to every B cell that the dendritic cell can find. The dendritic cell is the one who captures these pieces. Eventually, by chance, one B cell will recognize the virus by the simple fact our body just randomly comes up with receptors in order to read pathogens. The only drawback to this process, really, is that sometimes we create autoimmune diseases within ourselves as our body will attack complexes it recognizes as foreign if it's your own cell. And this may be how the virus skirts around the issue because the typical process is that your body recognizes viruses this way. However, our body will usually destroy those immune cells that might cause autoimmunological interactions. So this is what I think the 
crux of the issue is. It's clear that this virus does inspire an immune response, but only when it comes to the innate. I believe the virus may have something that causes it to present similar to human tissue in a way that our immune system would recognize it, and then an autoimmune issue would begin to present. But for those whose bodies cleared out the autoimmune cells, there was no response to it on the adaptive front. But this would also have an impact on the functionality of the innate immune system. Due to this virus potentially being similar or having similar recognizable complexes to human complexes, the innate would respond in a way that it does, triggering the inflammatory response that I believe we see at least in the eyes where it presents in the eyes. But something to know about viruses, which just is completely just strange, I guess is the best way you can put it. There are actually viruses that can trigger diabetes. Interior viruses have been known to cause this basically because your body then starts attacking your pancreas, which then your body doesn't release as much insulin and there you have diabetes. So moving back to the eyes, when a person is infected, they go from clear eyed to cloudy eyed. This would indicate that something in the eye itself is amiss. Naturally, or at least in the past, the eyes are known as immune privileged sites. A special relationship exists when the immune system needs to be really careful because the eyes have specific functions taking place within them that if the immune cells kind of get involved with, it could disrupt the process, which as you might guess, wouldn't be great for your eyesight. Sort of like throwing a wrench into an open engine head. Not great. Now the main issue is, is again, it's not 100% true that the eyes are immune privileged. And trust me, I'm running it back to the zombies here momentarily. I just want to prove that the immune response is there first. When the person is infected, once they turn, their eyes appear to go cloudy, which are likely cataracts. Due to new research, we now believe, or at least it's been proposed, that the immune system does in fact have some activity in the eyes, and this can cause these cataracts. For this to happen as quickly as it is, this process would need to be possible and with the virus. So the body is attacking itself, also destroying the eyes largely due to this interaction. And this holds, at least in my mind, a lot of weight concerning what happens to the rest of the body. The eyes are considered immune privileged, even with new findings, as the immune system may be involved, or at least more involved than we previously thought, but definitely less than with the rest of the body. This would mean other areas of the body that are immune privileged may also be at risk, the main one being the brain itself and also central nervous system as well as peripheral nervous system. You see, the destruction of the eyes gives huge clues as to what's happening internally. With the immune system's innate functions largely unchecked at this point, as potentially the virus is causing the body to basically become autoimmune, this pro-inflammatory response would kick into overdrive again, causing everyone's favorite swelling, meningitis. We see the beginning stages of this with people becoming extremely fatigued, like on the bus or completely passing out. As pressure is put on the brain, the central nervous system as a whole would basically start exhibiting severe illness rapidly. When Pete's hand was bitten, he mentions how he has a splitting headache, likely because the tissue around his brain is swelling. And as the tissue swells, when a person finally reaches a point where the brain damage is achieved, they will begin convulsing and seizing, much like how Barbara started seizing at the Winchester. But this inflammatory response has long-standing consequences as well. I doubt that these people are actually truly, at least fully gone, just that their bodies aren't reporting correctly back to the brains, and even then the brain is in no condition to actually respond appropriately. Sort of like when Mary is pushed over and falls on a pipe and she gets up, there's an issue with the sensory neurons reporting information, or there's an issue with the brain accepting that information. Once this infection has reached a point where inflammation is ramped up and the eyes are virtually destroyed, the brain has pressure put on it. I believe the cells will also to a degree attack neurons within the brain, in the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system. Areas that may have had minimal interaction with the innate immune system will now be under attack, which could result in something known as Guillain Barr syndrome or GBS. GBS is basically when the immune system attacks the myelin sheath that surrounds the axon, which helps speed up the electrical signals sent to the next neuron. When this happens, it can cause issues with walking coordination of the limbs, making movement strained and clunky, and ultimately result in paralysis if the cause isn't found. Typically, however, we know that the cause can be viral or bacterial, and in this case, it would definitely be viral. The specific syndrome brought on by the body's own response would definitely explain the movement exhibited, which appears appears uncontrolled and shaky. The nervous system itself is clearly suffering from the results of being infected by the virus, but it's moving up to the brain, and that is where the real issues lie. It's clear that the brain to some degree has been damaged by not only the inflammation of the meningeal layer of tissue surrounding the brain, but also by the immune system and virus itself. It is stated that the cerebral cortex has been heavily damaged. So what is the cerebral cortex? Well, the cerebral cortex being the outer layer of brain tissue, which is responsible for higher level processes such as consciousness, consciousness, thought, emotions, reasoning, language, and memory. With this area heavily altered by the pressure that has been put on it by meningitis, this would mean that the person that was originally in there would not remember friends, family, have the ability to reason what they are doing, likely cannot even understand what a person is saying to them as it would be almost like having some form of aphasia, and in general,
general would be largely out of the game. Their body would be running on a sort of autopilot, much like they were living in a society running on autopilot. Okay, but obviously inflammation and destruction of the brain tissue isn't the same across the board. While the body would likely be running on input from baser functions, or as it said, the brainstem, some of the cortex would still be operational as the entire brain has not been destroyed. And even some of the lower portions of the brain might have been affected as well. Basically, it's all on chance. And this is why we see several examples of people still being in there, such as when Sean says Pete's name and he looks up, Philip turning off the music in the car, the zombies later basically doing things that they did in life, Ed hanging out with Sean at the end, still playing PS2 because that's what he did originally, which this would all indicate that memory is still somewhat intact, the ability to understand language is somewhat intact, and likely there is some consciousness still intact because again, Sean ends up scolding Ed for almost biting him at the end, to which Ed responds by not trying again, but seems to understand that he shouldn't do that, so he just goes and plays PS2. So this would indicate that some of the cerebral cortex, depending on who you are and how the infection went, is definitely still intact. But moving to the lower portions of the brain, the hypothalamus would likely have been heavily impacted to the point that hunger would be ramped up as misfires cause a constant state of hunger. And due to the hypothalamus being affected by swelling or a direct attack by the immune system, this would open up the door for cannibalism to be more readily accepted. This combined with the pesky cerebral cortex being largely destroyed means the moral question of eating another person is completely out the window. It just really comes down to being hungry. But it's not just all hypothalamus either. Aggression through overstimulation or damage to the amygdala would be present, making the infected much more apt to bite. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Never in the history of knowing about rabies has a person ever bitten another by accident due to aggression because of the systems of checks and balances that we have, which is brought on by the functionality of the cerebral cortex. This has largely separated us from animals when it comes to being infected with rabies. Now, destroy the brain to the point that there are really no differences between us and animals and add on to the extreme hunger brought on by the hypothalamus damage, and this could explain why the infected will just straight up bite anyone. There is nothing preventing the baser urges any longer. Now, this may sound odd, but there's already something within every single one of us, and it's important to us. Think of it like a scale. You have human consciousness and rationalization on one side and baser instincts on the other. These will balance out one another typically, but even with that, sometimes it tends to tip one way or the other. So it's sort of like if you don't have any self-control necessary to distinguish choices, or maybe you're in a life or death scenario. Moving the weight from one side will obviously cause the other side to immediately win, at least win in that balance, which is exactly what the virus is doing when the brain is destroyed, or at least the higher portions of the brain. It being a virus would also mean that it's able to move through the body quite effectively, bypassing blood-brain barriers, and it may actually even infect neurons themselves. From here, it can move actually down into salivary glands and potentially could also be coughed up into the mouth like many other respiratory diseases. I believe it could largely be a combination of both these things, seeing as we do also see people coughing before the outbreak, but during the outbreak, we also see a lot of people salivating. This would seem to support that the possible initial vector is also airborne because it was able to enter the lungs and infect people from there. Now the question becomes, where did this come from? Well, there are three instances indicating a possible origin point, so let's take a look at them. The first one being on a radio report early in the morning that a deep space probe Omega-6 had unexpectedly broken apart over southeast England and then entered the atmosphere. Anything from space could have far-reaching implications if not contained as we have most definitely inadvertently seeded space with bacteria before in the past with probes which uh, then we subsequently brought those back and thought there was life from the moon. The second option is the paper that was talking about GMO crops and how they are messing with us but I don't really believe this to be the case as the illness that seemed to creep up out of nowhere it was way too fast and even though it could possibly hint at a bad crop why were there others spared in such a capacity why would a gmo crop also inspire changes and in people become aggressive and how it will literally deliver an illness to others and then we have the rage infected monkeys however while listening to another radio report later on it is stated that that is simply a bunch of bull and then cuts out taking a look at these options obviously all three are references to other movies rage monkeys being 28 days later the space probe being romero's night of the living dead and crops being related to the living dead at Manchester's morgue. Then the final report saying that the phenomenon was being a result of the use of something before the channel was changed. I still believe it probably is the space probe that holds the most promise. Fact is, we test bacteria, animals, viruses, basically life itself all the time in space. Because we need to know how these things are going to respond and how they will behave in low gravity environments or when exposed to different types of radiation from the sun if we're ever going to leave this planet. For instance, we know that the herpes virus 
virus, which can be dormant in people for years, can suddenly reactivate once you're in space. So potentially viruses become more aggressive and active when introduced into space. I believe the result is literally us experimenting on things consistently in space to see what happens. When the space probe re-entered our atmosphere, the biohazard team was taking extreme cautions to secure the site of the main probe as something was known about it that may not be known to others. I believe a test on a standard virus, something that could even be influenza, was done in space to see the effects. However, the virus being exposed to different radiation and being in space itself caused it to become more active and when breaking apart over southeast London, it rained down on all those below before those would actually go out and then spread it by a direct bite. Breathing in the virus would also give it access to the lungs and subsequently make a bite a really good way in order to spread it, leading to the events that we have seen in Shaun of the Dead. 